Hallelujah. It's Memorial Day, and it's when we honor our fallen soldiers. It's become something more than that. It's a lot of people just call it Decoration Day and we go and decorate all our graves, but originally it was to honor our fallen soldiers, and we want to recognize that. And all the soldiers who have fallen from from the beaches of France and into Germany and Italy, northern Africa. Uh, Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, through the Pacific, and uh, the rice paddies and jungles of Vietnam, and uh, into the deserts of Iraq and Afghanistan. We honor all, and all the other places. We honor them all that have given their lives that we can still worship freely. Amen? Amen. A lot of people don't remember that uh, America was founded as a Christian nation. And in one of the first settlings, in one of the first landfalls in the United States was at Cape Henry, which is a cape on the Atlantic shore of Virginia, uh, the northeast corner of Virginia Beach. And when they first landed there, the first thing they did was erect and plant a large wooden cross. And they prayed a, dare, uh, a prayer of dedication for this land and uh, for the safe voyage they had. But they prayed this, they prayed, Lord, let the word of God and Christianity go forth across this land and from this land around the world. That's our founding. We've come afar from it. And uh, in fact, we've come afar from the ideals of America, I think. And it's sad. It's sad to watch on the news and in so many places when people from here are putting our land and our country down. Praise God. And I still would like to sing with my head held high, God bless America. Amen. 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 But that's not my message this morning. I want to preach from this verse. Galatians 5, 7. Paul is writing to the church that he had founded at Galatia. And he's writing back because he had heard some things that were going on there. And so he writes this. He says, you were running well. Who hindered you? From obeying the truth. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? And I would add this, maybe, carefully, but I would add, what hindered you from obeying the truth? You hear a lot today about people telling their truth, and uh, they have their truth as opposed to your truth, and everyone needs to share their truth. As far as I know, there's only one truth, and His name is Jesus. And he proclaimed himself the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. There is this truth and there is no other. The truth of God and all that he created, that's the truth. There is no your truth and my truth. There is the truth. Amen. But there is a movement away from the faith of the Bible in the generations alive today. Especially in the younger generations. I hesitate to, to name them and put labels on them. They, they, they do. They put Y and X and Z and they have all these designations. But it's the generations coming up after us. And they're moving away from the faith. The faith of the Bible. They still proclaim that they're spiritual. They still proclaim that they're in touch with spiritual things. But they've moved away from the faith, the God of the Bible. And it breaks my heart. It really does. Um, it's among those especially that have grew up, grown up in a religious environment. Whether they went to a Christian school or, or, or to a church or in a Christian family. Whatever the case may be, it's among those who have grown up in a Christian environment. And uh, they had a childhood experience maybe. A conversion Salvation. They prayed at an altar. It was when they were very young and they experienced that and they were, they were absorbed in all that uh, uh, religious movement that they were a part of. And, and then they transitioned. They grew and they transitioned. And some, for some it was in high school. For others it's when they went away to college. And for others it was going into the workplace. And still for others it was maybe when they changed their set of friends. And they found a new set of friends and all of a sudden they found out that there were some things that they had missed out on growing up in a religious environment. At least, let me say this, some things they thought they missed out on. And they began to ask some adult questions about their faith and, and, and got faith-based answers to their fact-based fact questions. And 
They, they begin to peel away because they heard so much out there that was not what they were taught in Sunday school. And, and, and let me say this about Sunday school when I was growing up. Sunday school, and still is for the most part, very, very sanitized. There's an idealized Jesus. And there's things in the Bible that are, that are idealized and, and promoted. And this is what God is all about. And how, many, how many grew up in Sunday school listening about Noah and the ark? And we think, oh, this is wonderful. Two of every kind of animal. And, and here's Noah and his family getting on board. board the ark. And it's all sanitized because the ark is a, it's a tragedy. It's God's judgment of the whole world. And people by the millions and millions were dying all around them. But all we heard was God was good and he protected Noah and his family. And yes, he did, but that's not the whole story. And so because we didn't hear the whole story and our childhood Jesus, our Sunday school Jesus was, was so great and awesome and good. And, and we grew up and found out there was other things out in this world and there's evil in this world and, and we're not protected in this world. And so they started asking questions and they got faith-based answers. And, and I'm as guilty as anyone of that. Because I heard this growing up, and I think I, I, I've said it a time or two to others. Well, you just have to believe. You just have to have faith. And, and while it's true, you do have... It's believing. We believe on Jesus Christ. We believe that He rose from the dead. And it's by faith that we're saved through grace. But they didn't get the answers they wanted to hear, and they stopped believing. And they started walking away. And they started pulling back. There are some in this generation that come after us that uh, grew up in church. I mean, literally grew up in church. I'm one of those children. <laughs> I grew up in church from the age of two. And I remember going through my own experience of, is this real? And is, is there something I, I, more than this? And is there something different from this? And I remember going through all those questions. And, but there's a bunch alive today that are coming after us. And... They had a childhood conversion and they grew up in church, maybe in a Christian home. And then they got to a place as an adult that they began to question everything. 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 They began to question parts of the Bible that they didn't quite agree with. Because everybody today says, well, God is love and that's all God is. He's love. And yes, I know that God is love, but He's also a God of justice and He's also a God of holiness and but there's a group today, there's generations today that say, God is love. And, and so we just can't quite agree with some of the things in the Bible. We need justice for all. And let me say this about justice. You can't have justice without a judge. Huh? You know who the judge is? <laughs> in fact, Jesus said all judgment was given into His hand by God the Father. So there has to be a judge. And there's some things that have to be judged. Amen. But those that grew up in the church and had their childhood conversion experience and, and, and believed and, and taught in Sunday school and learned the scriptures in Sunday school and the memory verses and all that. And then as they grew up, they had a faith crushing event happen in their lives. Maybe for some, it was a faith devastating event. How many know that we go through things? I mean, know that just because you're a child of God and you belong to the body of Christ that it doesn't protect you from things that go on. In fact, there are some devastating things and crushing things that go on simply because we're children of God because the devil hates us and he throws everything against us. In fact, his whole goal is to rob you of your faith. And so they had a faith-crushing event or experience and, and began to question everything they thought they knew about God. Everything. And stop believing that all of this in this book is true. I need to state right now unequivocally before I go farther. I believe in this book. I believe it's the inspired word of God. I believe it from generation, uh, from, from Genesis, all through the generations, through the word of God to the maps at the end of the book. I believe every bit of it. I know there are parts in here that are simply historical. I know that. I realize that. But I know that there are inspired words of God in here. Prophets spoke in this Bible. And it's recorded here. And I know in the New Testament, it was inspired and breathed on by the Holy Spirit as holy men of old wrote this book. But again, there's a generation that stopped believing. They stopped reading their Bible. They're pulling away from church. They're pulling away from 
They're not going into atheism because they know there has to be something. They're almost going into a Star Wars kind of faith. There's some kind of force in the universe. If we can just tap into that. and Well, there is a force in the universe. It's called God. Amen. One person wrote about this, about their own experience of losing their childhood faith in the God of the Bible. And they, they wrote this. We learned about God about the same time we were told about Santa Claus as children. But while our understanding of Santa Claus evolved and matured, our theology remained somewhat infantile. Not surprisingly, when we attained intellectual maturity, some of us rejected God, at least the God that we inherited. Maybe that's right. Maybe it's because they grew up with a God that never really did exist. And maybe it's our fault in the church and maybe it's our fault as pastors that we never preach the real truth and the whole counsel of God the way it should have been. I've tried to, I've always tried to read through the book and I've always tried to put more scriptures than anything up there. Not this morning, I'm not going to have very many scriptures, but I've always preached the Word because that's what Paul told Timothy to do. Preach the Word. But maybe they grew up with a different God. Maybe they heard a different God because that's what they wanted to hear. And so maybe some people grew up with a, and, and Andy Stanley paraphrased this word, a guardrail God or a bodyguard God. Then he was a God who would protect you and keep you. And if you're a Christian, nothing bad would ever happen to you. How many know that's false? <laughs> How many know that we fight battles as Christians? We go into warfare as Christians. Amen. I don't know where they would ever get that from. I know they didn't get it from me because I preached the whole counsel of God and I preached from the, book, the, uh, from the book of Job before. And you know what? All you have to do is read the book of Job and find out bad things do happen to good people, to holy people, to righteous people, to children of God. But they begin to see bad things happen. And bad things happen to people that they were close to and People died that they had prayed for. And people didn't get well that they had prayed for. And then they went through their own period possibly of tragic events in their own life. And they were praying for God to move. And it didn't happen the way it should have happened or when it should have happened. And, and your faith in God began to dim again. I know this, you won't find anywhere in the Bible that bad things never happen to good people. In fact, all the way through from Genesis all the way to, through to the book of Revelation, you find bad things happening to all kinds of people. In fact, let me say this. Let me, let me declare this. Christianity, this faith that we believe in, salvation, all started with a horrible thing happening to a very good person. A perfect person named Jesus Christ. The people He came to, the people He came to save, and the people He came to redeem ended up crucifying Him. And that's how this all started. With something horribly bad happening to the very person that came to save our souls. All the Bible heroes of the New Testament. We won't even go to the Old Testament. We know about them. Lions, dens, and other things that happened to them. Fiery furnaces. But the heroes of the New Testament were all treated terribly. And horribly persecuted. Some of them killed. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, was beheaded. While Jesus was beginning his ministry, they took John into, under arrest and, and chopped his head off. Peter, John, thrown in prison right after the church began for healing a man at the temple gate. I could go on and on. James, uh, uh, one of the leaders in the early church, he was thrown in prison. He was killed. Paul, the Apostle Paul, our Apostle, the Apostle to the Gentiles. Hallelujah. He describes his walk with Jesus and his ministry for the Lord like this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A, day, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in the water, left for dead, stoned outside the city gates. 
He goes on in verse 26, In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the, in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, and besides the other things that comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches that he had pioneered and planted all over the Mediterranean and up into Europe. The Bible says very clearly that we live in a sin-cursed world. This is not the world. The world we're living in right now is not the world that God created. He created a paradise. Read about it in Genesis, the first two or three chapters. And you'll find out that He created and said it was good. And the next day He created and it was good. And the next day He created. It was all good. And then He got to the seventh day and He rested and said it's done. I've created and it's all good. And I don't know the interval. I don't know how long Adam and Eve, his wife, were in the garden before this happened. I don't know. We're not told really. But one day the serpent came. Satan came. And enticed Eve and she ate of the one. It still boggles my mind. They had one commandment. Just one. That's it. You can eat of every tree of the garden. But the one in the center, don't eat of that tree. One commandment. And so she partook and she ate and she gave to Adam and he ate. When that happened, sin entered into God's perfect paradise. In fact, it was so horrible that he kicked them out and kicked them out of the garden and they were out into the world and sin entered into this world and now we're corrupted because of sin. Listen, this is not what God created. The body I'm living in physically today is not what God created. Our DNA is messed up. Our DNA is corrupted. Because of sin entering the world. Not only is our DNA corrupted, our spiritual lives were corrupted. Everything about God's perfect paradise was corrupted because sin entered in. And through that sin, the devil got, got authority over Adam. Because Adam was, listen, God gave to Adam the care and, and, and authority over all of this paradise. And now he handed it over to Satan. And so the Bible says very clearly that we're living in a sin-cursed world. There's evil in this world. There's more evil than we can imagine in this world. And there's an evil one in this world. And he's trying his very best. The Bible says he comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And that evil one is after you and he's after me. And he's after everyone in this world to turn them against the one true living God. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, we know we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world. Every bit of it. So there's some that grew up in the church and then they got out there and they began to develop friends in the world and they thought they were missing out on some things and they began to have enjoy those friends more than they enjoyed God. Let me say right up front, nothing wrong with having sins in the world. Jesus did. In fact, if you read through the Gospels, you'll find out this truth. People who were nothing like Jesus liked Him. And you know what He did? He liked them back. Not only did He like them back, He loved them. And He reached out to them. And He healed them. And He touched them. And He said, receive salvation. And they did. And they are the ones who became His followers. The problem with the generations coming behind us is that they're going with their friends in the world and becoming more like their friends instead of staying like Jesus and inviting their friends into what this new life is all about. So maybe they grew up with a God that was a good God and only good things would happen to God's people. And that God never did exist. He never did exist. Never did. Maybe they grew up with an on-demand God. On demand. It's everywhere today, isn't it? We drive through uh, the fast food restaurants and holler into the microphone and pull up to the window and get our food right then. We want it now. Even, even on our TV channels now, we not only watch TV at the prescribed time the shows are on, but we can watch them anywhere we want to. There's such a thing as called on demand. 
And you can watch it on whatever device you have, whether your phone or tablet or whatever you have, anywhere you want to, in any time you want to. You don't have to wait till Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock to watch your favorite show. You can watch it anywhere on demand. And you know what? People expected that out of God. He's an on-demand God. What do you mean on-demand God? A God who responds to our prayers and our requests right now. Or at least in the time frame that we need the answer and that we think you should move and think you should answer and <coughs> excuse me. And give us exactly what we want to have. On demand, God. Here's my request. When am I going to give it? And it didn't happen that way. But they decide if there's a personal God, then God's going to give me what I need and, and what I want and when I want it and when I need it. I learned a long time ago that He's God and I'm not. And He sees tomorrow and He sees next week. And He knows what's good for me better than I know what's good for me. Amen? Amen. Oh, I'm still going to pray for the sick to be healed. I'm still going to pray for things to happen and for miracles. I'm believing for that. In fact, I'm going to close this message with a prayer I've been praying lately. Uh, God laid it in my heart. I've been praying it for a while now. But God is not an on-demand God. And there are some things He withholds for a time and for a season. And there's a timing in everything. He has His own timeline that says, this is the opportune, most, best, the Kairos time for this to happen. You know what? I got saved very young and if God gave me everything I prayed for when I was young and in my teens, my life would probably be a wreck right now. Uh, huh? I probably would have married the wrong person, been in the wrong uh, job, and, and who knows, my life would have been a wreck if God gave me everything I prayed for. Another part of on-demand God is that you, you felt like you needed to experience His presence all the time. And I think some of that is a fault of, uh, of Pentecostal and Spirit-filled churches because we preach such an emotional God and feeling the presence of God. and You need to, you need to experience all that. And, and we made it such an experience and such a part of our, our, our walk with Jesus that people decided, well, if I'm not experiencing God, if I don't feel His presence, then He must not be here for me. I don't know about you all, but there's been long stretches where I haven't felt the presence of God. I've walked through some dark valleys. I've walked through some stretches by faith where I knew God was there. But I'm like Job. I looked on the right hand. He wasn't there. The left hand, I couldn't find him. And before and behind. But he was there all the time. Someone said this. We are least aware of the things that are most constant in our lives. Let me say it another way. There are things that are always there in our lives and there's, there's so much of a part of our lives that they suddenly become background noise because we get used to it. Huh? Sometimes I think that's the way it is with God. We don't make the effort. He's always there. He's always there. We have this promise. We have a promise in Hebrews 13, 5. He himself has said, I will never leave you, never forsake you. But that doesn't mean we're going to feel his presence every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're going to walk through valleys. We're going to walk through darkness. He's always there. Even when you don't feel Him, He's always there. Amen. Another God from our childhood, and I dealt with this, was the anti-science God. I grew up in some of the really fundamental churches or we associated with some of those fundamental churches. And, and, and uh, I can remember when I was very young, there was a constant tension between science and God and You've got to have faith and you just believe and, and science has got this and it's... When I would ask questions after learning some things in school, I would say, well, what about this and what about that? And it's just, well, you just have to believe and have faith in the Bible. And Well, yes, we have to believe. But we don't have to choose between God and science because the more discoveries science makes, the more they, they figure out that there had to be a creator. It's in, it's, I've been reading about it lately. The more breakthroughs they have in the scientific world, the more they figure out there had to be a creator, a divine intelligence that put this all together. It couldn't have happened randomly or by chance. 
It couldn't have happened that two uh, chemicals that made rock all of a sudden decided we're not going to make rock today. We're going to join and make something else and create life. And, and that life created another life. And, and they begin to run and jump. And, and Listen, it's crazy. There has to be a God. I found this out in some of my studies is that science began with Christians. And you know why it began with a lot of Christians? Isaac Newton and some of those, they were Christians. And, and they decided that God created everything, all of time, all of space, and, and all of matter. And since God created everything, and then He stopped, and everything's created that's going to be created, then everything now runs on the laws that He set in motion. The laws of physics, and the laws of nature, and the laws of natural selection. And, and, and all we have to do is observe and, and, and discover the laws that God has already set in motion. So the scientists came from the Christian faith because they knew that God was done creating. And now we can discover everything He created. And so if you grew up with any of those gods and lost faith because it wasn't the God that you saw, let me just say this. Those gods that I've been speaking about, they didn't really exist. There is no on-demand God. We don't command Him. We're His servants. Amen? And there is no God that protects us from everything in this world because we live in a sin cursed world and we fight a devil that hates our guts and, and it's a spiritual warfare almost daily anymore. Here's what I know. This is what I know and absolutely believe. Jesus died on the cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb for three days, and on the third day, rose from the dead. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I believe that. And I know that because the, the, the writers of the New Testament just didn't write about what they believed and what they had faith in. You know what they wrote about? They wrote about what they saw. They were eyewitnesses to this. Even Paul, who was, had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, was caught up into the third heaven, probably one of those times when he's left for dead, stoned outside the city. But they saw and they wrote, this is what we saw and this is what we know. We have their eyewitness accounts. That's what our New Testament is about. Amen. John, the disciple that Jesus loved, the one that leaned against him at the Last Supper. The one that was put on the Isle of Patmos in his persecution. Left there uh, in isolation and received the revelation of Jesus Christ and wrote about it. Here's what John says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. They were talking about, he's talking about Jesus. We saw him with our own eyes. We touched him. We handled him which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. John was saying, we walked roads with Him. We had meals with Him. We ate fish on the seashore with Him after the resurrection. Hallelujah. We walked with Him for 50, 40 days after the resurrection. And He talked to us and spoke with us. He appeared in the room that we were locked in right after the resurrection. Came in and said, look, here's the scars in my hand. And we touched Him and we saw Him. And they wrote about it. And they believed it so much that they were willing to die for their faith in the persecution of the Roman emperors. He goes on in verse 3, 1 John 1, 3, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Hallelujah. And I, I know, because I've had an experience with Jesus as my Savior. Started with my, when I was a nine-year-old boy kneeling at this altar right here. And I gave my life to Christ. And I've been following Him. Oh, there's been some dark periods. There's been some periods when I question everything about God. But along the way, He assured me. And He instructed me. And could I say this? My faith has grown up. I don't believe in the Sunday school God anymore. I have an adult faith that trusts God because I've been through a few things. Amen? Amen? He's been with me. 
Not constantly, but He's been with me. And there have been miracles in my life that I can point to and say, God did this. There's things that Cindy and I have shared together that we know it couldn't have been any other thing except God intervened. And I've had my own experiences. Late one night I was walking here in this church. It's been years ago. And I was walking up and down the center aisle just praying. And I got halfway down the aisle going that way. And I felt a presence behind me. And it was such an awesome thing. I didn't dare turn around and look. I knew I'd faint dead away if I did. But God was there. I don't know if it was Him or an angel He sent. But I know this. There was a heavenly presence right behind me. And began to speak to me personal things. And assurances for my life. And asking me some things. If I would be willing to obey in this and that. And I said yes. What are you going to say when you feel the presence right? <laughs> and he's been faithful. Amen. My faith has grown up. But I found this out. The more my faith has grown up. The more questions I have. And the more, I, the more I'm learning and understanding about God. And I've discovered this. God is not afraid of your questions. Read the book of Job again. It's a book of suffering, but it's also a book of people questioning God and questioning God. And He's not afraid of questions. I've discovered that if we ask Him honestly to reveal Himself to us, He will. He will. It's not widespread in the news Missionaries have shared it and I have news feeds and things and blogs that I go to to read news on the mission field. And, and this is a phenomenon that's happening through the Middle East in Muslim countries especially. And they're very careful not to name names because they would get in trouble. But here's what I know from missionary accounts, first-hand missionary accounts. Muslim people have been getting revelations of God appearing to them, angels appearing to them, and talking to them about Jesus, the one true God, and they are converting because God's revealing Himself. And He will. This generation coming behind us needs a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And of the, of the true God, the one true God. They need to see God for themselves. They don't need to hear us to say, well, it's all by faith and you just have to believe. They need to see it. They need to know it. That's why one of my prayers, one of my strong prayers lately has been the same prayer that the disciples prayed. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 29 and 30, here's what they prayed. I've paraphrased one little small part. They said, look on our persecution. I've changed that. And here's what I've been praying. Now, Lord, look on what is happening. And sometimes when I pray that, I say, Lord, look at the generations today and how far they're drifting. Let me, let me add this in. Did you know that Jesus said in Matthew 24 when, when the disciples asked Him, what's the sign of the end of the age and the sign of Your coming, Your return? And He gave them the signs that would happen. And we see all those signs happening in nature. And we see things. The, the nations of the world. There is, there is an alignment of the signs that Jesus gave. So much stronger today than ever has been before. But He gave two signs that really disturbed me. In the midst of the earthquakes and weather. And, and nations against nations. And all the other things. Jesus said in Matthew 24.10. Many will fall away. I'm seeing it. We're witnessing it. Two verses later in verse 12, Matthew 24, 12, he said, and because iniquity or wickedness would abound and be prevalent everywhere, that the love of many would grow cold. And we're seeing that as well. So here's what I'm praying. Now, Lord, look on what is happening to the generations behind us. And grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. By stretching out your hand to heal. And that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus.
And that's what I'm praying. Lord, restore to your church healings and signs and wonders through our people in your pulpits one more time. And I'm praying that prayer because I believe that there are many today who need to see the power and the might of the living God for their own selves. We live in a visual generation. Everything about them is visual and they're going to have to see a visual sign that God is real. I know he said, well, blessed are those who don't see and still believe. I know that. I understand he said that, but I also know this. I also know that there were some that came questioning him and, and he answered them this. He said, well, if you don't want to believe me for what the Word says, believe me for what you see happening. And you know what? There's a generation today that needs to see happening in the church. Real healings. Not somebody's headache got healed. But real, live, miraculous healings. In the house of God. Signs and wonders. In the house of God. I've shared with all of you. We showed it on our screen. What was happening here. Uh, <clears throat> at the end of a prayer I made. And we saw the, the flame and the dove. Of the Holy Spirit flying through our church. On our security camera up here. That's wonderful. I was thrilled when I saw that. I've shared it with some others. And. And everybody attested that yes, this is genuine. But you know what I want to see? I want to see that happen on a Sunday morning. I want to hear a rushing mighty wind flow through this place and tongues of fire or however God wants to do it. Not in my box and not how I want, but I just want God to do something visible and manifested that we can see and know God is real. And He's still real right now, today. He's still a powerful God. He's still a real God. Amen. And I'm encouraged because the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe He can do something for our generation Amen. before it's too late. Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And my prayer is, Lord, all those who have grown cold and all those who have walked away or are in the process of walking away. And not just to you that are gathered here, but those that are watching or will watch this message online. If you've walked away from your faith because you couldn't trust it, because you had so many questions, I invite you to come back one more time. In fact, I invite you to come back and try Jesus for the first time all over again in truth and reality and ask Him to reveal Himself to you. Amen. And I believe He will. I believe He will. Amen. Would you pray with me this morning as we close? That God would reveal Himself to the generations today. Here's the promise in Acts 2, 17 and 18. There's a promise of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that says in the last days. And it says that that outpouring would be on sons and daughters and on young and old all at the same time. A multi-intergenerational experience of God. I'm praying for that to happen now. To reclaim those who have grown cold. To reclaim those who are in the process of walking away from their faith. So would you pray with me? Would you join me in that prayer? Father, there are so many who have been disappointed. They've grown up believing in a Sunday school God and their faith didn't grow up as they grew up and they experienced some things in this world and they experienced some devastating things in their spiritual walk with You. And Lord, they're walking away. It's a trick of the devil and I know that. I know he's enticing and he's putting questions in their mind. But Lord, we need to see You. 
For the sake of those coming behind us, Lord, we're pleading, reveal yourself, your presence in this generation today. One more time, Lord. One more time. Signs and wonders in your church, in the body of Christ. One more time, let the Holy Spirit move and gift as He will through us, Lord. And let us see the healings and the miracles and miraculous, unexplainable things that only God could do in our midst. Lord, I'm praying, shake this place once again with your power. One more time, Lord, let your presence be seen, felt, and known today. Lord, we need you. We need you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.